welcome to the Beauties and Beasties podcast with Alex Coulson. Hello, hello, hello. How are we all doing? Good, pal. How the devil are you? I'm doing very well. I, I've had quite a, a sedate week this week. It's been quite lovely. Instead of having a, a thousand courses and various bits and bobs to do, I've just been catching up on a lot of paperwork and writing reports and setting the ball rolling for new projects going into summer. So it's been a nice week, actually. And um, yeah, it's been good. How about you? Uh, yeah, we've had a... Um... We can feel some are starting to kick off now, so we're at that handover phase where we're getting um, honeybee inquiries through, but we're still getting rats and drains jobs. So um, we've had a couple of decent ones for both of them, um, which will be quite interesting. And my bees are starting to kick off my own personal bees, so they're taking a bit of time up on a Saturday or a Sunday. In fact, this bank holiday, I've done Sunday and Monday with the bees, two full days. Um, How many bees do you have was, now? Uh, I'm not asking for individual counts here. You can uh, give yeah, me a, like, a, a yeah. hive count. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like you know when you're in the in the garage and your missus says to you, "How much have you spent on all these tools?" and it's an awkward question because yeah. So I, I don't know. I probably, I think I've probably got somewhere around about the 38 colonies. Maybe it's a couple more. Maybe it's a couple less. Um. I thought we were going to unite something to bring the numbers down, but after Sunday and Monday, they will probably stop where they are because they're, they're all looking okay. Um, there isn't anything there that looks right. terribly bad. So, yeah, they're doing okay. How's your bees so, uh, Well, I was about to say, your bees take you two days. My bees take me uh, the best part of an hour because I have one colony. It's doing all right. It does its own thing. Don't really care. <laughs> um, that's about it. I literally only check to see if it's got brood in there um, to make sure the queen's all right. And if the queen's all right, then every so often pick out a queen cell. I literally have to do nothing. It is that they are just... <laughs> just it, it's so easy isn't it um when you've yeah. just got one um but i have but well, this is actually the thing i have to move my uh because i've got my uh hive up on top of an old uh agricultural trailer so it's just at the end of a field um cornering two fields of beans of all things so they've got a lot of forage for them when the beans come through but um it's on an old agricultural trailer so actually the bottom of the hive starts about chest height so i have to i have to do my uh, inspections from on on top of a little sort of like step ladder that i've built um but they're they're wanting to move the trailer they're doing a bit of a clear away and a bit of a clean out so i'm going to have to suddenly move my bees and it's that old rule isn't it three feet or three miles so i'm going to have to gonna have to do something cunning with that there's a little stand of woodland just behind them that i might put them in is there no idle seed rape around there no they stopped doing that um a couple of years well a couple of years back now because we have so much issues with flea beetles and oil seed rape and when the initial ban on neonics came through the farm made the decision just to stop um, producing oil seed rape um but now they have uh, this is going to be the first year that they're going to plant some out um just because they believe that they have a chance at um doing a decent crop this year so it's going to be the first year so I'll, I'll see but it's almost all um cereal and um beans uh down on the farm right, where i, I am so I did, did you see that darren monk played a bit of a blinder there and he actually put his hi everyone on at the very start of the thing to make sure he was first one in so well done darren well played wayne gardner's coming really and said hello and i know who tedster is because if anyone can guess who tedster is by the end of the um, fit, by the end of the program, you will win ten bonus points. Oh, what do bonus points get us? Are we doing a points sharing scheme now? What's what's going on here? Yeah, no, I, I, there's there's no prize. That's the problem. So they can just have ten bonus points. Um, oh, yeah, talking Tedster, of, I'm sure I know who Tedster is. Talking of prizes, actually, it probably behooves us to mention before we go much further in uh, two things. Number one, um, we have been uh, running a sweepstake, haven't we? So. Um, mm -hmm. off the back of this podcast and off some comments made last week on uh, the podcast with John. Um, 
I decided to chuck in some money. Sean then matched that. Hugh then matched that. And then I believe we're taking some from um, the UK BR um, uh, yeah. who are going to match it as well. And the sweepstake basically is, what is it, Sean? It's um, who can get closest to? The number of Asian hornet nests found by the end of the summer. So I think we were going to have a cutoff date of um, the last day of October, I think. Um and the person who wins that will get 100 quid. I can't, I think when I spoke to Hugh, he said that it would maybe have to be 100 pound Amazon vouchers. It might just be a straight 100 quid cash transfer, or whatever. If you're going to complain, don't join because it's free 100 pound. <laughs> Spend it. It is, yeah, no, it, um, it's 100 pounds worth well, of we'll Amazon vouchers, I believe. Um, Amazon yeah, vouchers. So Amazon vouchers. But yeah, with that, it, it again, uh, that, that should mention uh, before we go too much further in this whole series, this whole mini series of podcasts has been sponsored by the UKBR and they have yeah. uh, some of that sponsorship has gone to this sweepstake. So thank them very kindly for that. But Sean, tell us a little bit about the UKBR because there's going to be some folks listening to this for the first time that have no um, uh, yeah. idea. I'm a member and it has absolutely worked to my advantage all last year, the year before and probably this year. It is an organization akin to like the MPTA, BPCA, but for honeybee removal. It is a place where a, a member of the public or a business who has a feral colony within their building can go and find an independent bee remover. Um, the, there are other things which aren't quite the same. And it is a it's it's a good thing. You know, it's it's really pushed that industry forward, hasn't it? Um, where I guess there wasn't one before the UKBR. It was very cottage industry. It's become a more mainstream and it's opening it up to lots of pest controllers and beekeepers. Um, mm. Don't know about the percentages, but there's both doing it. Um, it's and interesting, say, Jason's a... now becoming both, any. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, he's uh, as we heard on his podcast a couple of weeks back, he's really wanting to push the um, his beekeeping further forwards. And um, it's the uh, it was the bee removals that really um, encouraged him to do that. But I, I have yeah. to say, as a, as a consultant, I don't do bee removals myself. Um, I'm not equipped for it. I don't have the tools, the inclination, the patience uh, or the willingness to stand in a bee suit and um, upset 50,000 irate bees. So I often, as a, a consultant, will refer people through to the UK bee are because I will get calls I get calls all the time from people you know Wade Environmental sounds very much like a company that should be doing bees um, but I, I will refer them on and the great thing about the UK BR is I know that the people who are in it um, are going to be professional at the end of the day so if you are a pest manager who is looking to add this to your repertoire absolutely have a look at the UK BR look to join and um, get that stamp of approval um, and if you're listening to this and you are having an issue with bees and this time of year is going to be when you start noticing them coming out of the cracks and crevices in your walls and tiles have a look for them because there's going to be genuinely um you, it's it's better than having a cowboy taking down half your wall and then running off um without making good the repairs which we yeah. we have seen stories like that before haven't we or people uh tying ladders to um what was it we, we saw a picture a little while back of someone tying a ladder to somebody's chimney stack um it would things like that it was it was quite frightening wasn't it yeah yeah we um do you know it, it, it i could and I know lots of others could absolutely um, shine a light on the bad practices of certain things, but I, do, I don't think that's beneficial to anyone. I think it's sim it's simplest to say that for those who want a professional job done, it's a great place yeah. to start looking, you know. Absolutely. Oh, yes. No, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to, you know, uh, uh, build people. No, because I do that, don't I? I can't help myself. I just shout my mouth off, but... <laughs> I'm trying my hardest not to, Alex. So I'm going to be nice and professional because I'm learning. Well, this is a strange role reversal then this evening, isn't it? I don't know what's <laughs> happened here. This must be some kind of tipsy turvy Tuesday. Um, but there we go. No, well, without much further ado, we should probably probably bring our main guest on, shouldn't we? Do you know who it is this week? I, I haven't been paying. I do. Um, it's a lovely lady by the name of Kirstine. I'm not going to introduce her. She can introduce herself. When she comes on, she's very conscious that she's got a bit of a sore throat. Um, so please, nobody mention it. I won't bring it up a few times. <laughs> no, I think I think we've dodged that quite nicely. There we go. <laughs> nicely done. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah brilliant. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, hello. Good evening. Yeah, How I'm on doing? the tail end of a, a, a kind of a throaty, chesty thing. 
it's fairly disgusting but i'm all right it, it's all right it just adds to the um as i said before the ambiance doesn't it it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a little less podcast and a little more blues you know blues oh, den there okay. yeah you know, we, we, just we, need a smoke like machine that. don't we or something like that. I was about to say, I'm sure, sure we've all got someone with a vape somewhere we can we can just sort of <laughs> improvise, can't we? Um, but there we go. No, Kirsten, it's it's lovely to have you on. Do you want to tell us good. just a little bit about yourself? Just um, yeah. who are you, and and how yeah. did you get to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've now been in post um, with the BBKA as their outreach officer for just over a couple of months. I um, started at the beginning of February. Um, before that, I was actually working for the BBC for 25 years um, Whoa, in local really? broadcasting. Really? What did you do for the BBC? Yeah. I worked in local radio as a producer to start off with and then as a presenter in later years. So um, quite quite a sea change. Um, and it just, I just, I saw the job advertised. I took a bit of a break. I took voluntary redundancy last year. I took a bit of a break, um, saw the job advertised. And it just kind of ticked all the boxes, really, in terms of what I thought I could do and what I would like to do in a, in a new role um, and what I thought I could bring to the table. So, um, yeah, I've been working as the outreach officer. I'm not a beekeeper. I'm not a beekeeper. So it really is a leap of faith on behalf of the BBKA to um, recruit me into this post. Um, it's been a ride and a half. I've learned so much. I really has it, have has it tempted you to to keep bees. Then have you have you um, looked at this and thought, you know what? I've been missing a trick here. I need to get I, some honey. Give me another couple of months, because um, yeah, I can I can really see the appeal. But you know, when I first started and I joined in some of the meetings, at some of the BBKA at committee meetings, and all these different you know bee terminology was being thrown around, and I was sitting there on my phone, sort of you know quietly googling uh, this and that, and uh, trying to get my head around uh, all these different you know all these different abbreviations, the MBU and the NNSS and DEFRA I already knew about. Um, so yeah, it's been a real, it's been a real learning curve. Um, I, do you know what I, you could write on the back of a postage stamp what I knew about the Asian Hornet before this. It's something I'd heard of. It was kind of on my radar, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know much. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's been um, really, really busy. Uh, we've been working really, really hard. And what's interesting is, is that I kind of, well, it's been quite challenging in some respects because I've sort of come into this situation when so much has already happened. You know, last year, last year was just off the scale, really, wasn't it, in terms of what we saw down in, in Kent and along the, the south coast. Uh, and obviously this has been building for a number of years. And I've sort of come in kind of midway through the process here where so much the ball is already rolling. And I had all these grand ideas about who I was going to contact and who the main stakeholders would be and who we could partner up with. And I really, you know, didn't, I've, I've been educated so much by so many of the members of the BBKA who have already done so much really good outreach work. So um, I've learned a lot from them in terms of particularly down in the Kent area, huge, huge amount of um, outreach and public awareness raising has already taken place um and of course you've got the situation on jersey and i've had some wonderful conversations with john who i understand who i see is there um watching this evening hello john thank you for all your help so far so um i've had wonderful conversations with um the isle of Wight bka and found out an awful lot about how they've approached this situation so i've had an awful lot to get to grips with um but people have been people like john have just been incredible Oh, that's fantastic. And it, it's mm -hmm. good to see that it's, I think every one of these podcasts that we've had so far, the, the main message has been around communication and community and getting the message out. So I'm glad to see that we've got four for four so far. So that is um, that is good stuff. But before we go and talk a little bit more about uh, Asian hornets and bees and the rest of it, mm -hmm. uh, I do want to talk about the BBC. Sorry, that, that, that sounds like <laughs> such an amazing post. Um, because I'm there, there are, and I can see there's a lot of pest managers on here. And I know myself, we've all been on local radio and we've all many of us have gone on to talk about weevils and rats and you know every time there's something there just mm. how often just just out of it did you do any kind of like pesty related uh interviews or segments uh in your probably. time not probably. Your first story. probably at some point in the past I, I don't recall it being something that i did an awful lot of um but I, I imagine, yeah, at some point in the past I have. What's really interesting, though, is that I'm still in the mindset of 
being the interviewer. So I can think of a thousand and one things I'd love to ask you guys. I'm not quite used to being on the receiving end of it and having to think up the answers. And, you know, so, um, yeah, it's a really strange kind of scenario. to be. That, that, that suits me fine. Ask Sean anything <laughs> you like. That's all good with me. Um, he's he, he has a, he's a quick wit and a razor sharp mind. <laughs> um, yes. Just like a button. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, that's quite, do you know, already, just quickly jump in, Dominique um, from Belgium, he's instrumental in their Asian Hornet plans. You've got um, John de Carteret, who's instrumental in their, in Jersey. So there's, you know, Gillian's, um, I don't know what she does with the BBK, but I see Gillian contributing an awful lot. So hopefully it's making a bit of a difference. Yeah. A I mean, tell us. A lot of those sorry. people I've already been in contact with. It's just, it's, it's. It, there's been this real sense of um, because John has been absolutely um, instrumental in terms of sharing a lot of the resources that that have already sort of been created in terms of communications resources. But also, he's got the really, really important footage. He's got the photos. He's got the video footage because it's happening there and has been for some time in in in, in quite such an extreme way. So he's he's been uh, his input has been um, absolutely vital, you know, invaluable, really. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. So I mean, that that kind of like um, brings us on to I mean, a, a, a question that we should ask, which is you mentioned all these acronyms before, and there's going to be pest managers listening to this mm -hmm. who are not beekeepers but are interested in joining the fight against the Asian hornet. So mm -hmm. of course. You said that you are the BBKA, and before we get onto that in a bit, you mentioned a couple of others as well. There was the MBU and the NSSSSS. What was the what was the NSSS? Yeah, that was exactly my response when I first had it. So you got so you've got DEFRA, you got AFA. We know we know which those ones are. You got the Non Native Species Secretariat, and then you've got the MBU, which is the National Bee Unit, and then you've obviously got the BBKA. Uh, okay, yeah. so um, so that that's the chain which goes down. Of course, I did. when you said the non-native species secretariat, I know exactly who that is, but I've never yeah. referred to them by acronym before. I've just referred to them as by title. It so, takes a long time to type that all out in an email, though. So. <laughs> that's true. I don't write it down very often. <laughs> so what 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 is their role in all of this? Because we're we're quite familiar with what DEFRA and AFRA's role is, and we're passingly familiar with what MBU and BBK are going to do, although those lines tend to get blurred by the boots on yeah. the ground. Um, so what is the purpose of the non-native species secretariat then? From my understanding thus far, and I've had some dealings with them, but it has largely been in the realms of can you, because a lot of the uh, resources in terms of information sheets, and posters and that kind of thing that are our members really want to be able to get their hands on to help kind of spread the word within their communities. Um, I've really only had dealings with them in that in that regard, as in I did get in touch in the in the early days and kind of say, you know, how, how can we work together? From my understanding, a department of AFA who purely deal in um, worrying about and trying to keep at bay invasive species and limit the impact of them. So uh, quite a key player. Um, when it comes to Asian hornets, whereas the National Bee Unit, from my understanding, tend to focus more on uh, the health and protection of, of, of bees rather than worrying about the non-native side of things. Um, so all kind of fitting into to the sort of the big jigsaw puzzle of, of, of tackling this challenge. From my understanding, like I say, my dealings with them so far have purely been in the, in the instance of, you know, how can you help me, you know, help the people that I represent essentially. So communication has been sort of fleeting, but it, it has been there. But most of my communication, to be perfectly honest, has been with the people who are already on the ground fighting this and have that mm. boots on the ground experience, to be perfectly honest. I definitely would like to ask you a couple of questions about that in a bit. Um, but I, I believe the BPCA and probably even the MPTA, um, I, I, I am aware that they have been in contact and discussion with the non-native species secretariat because that's that's who they turn to to ask um, when are we going to get involved? It's them and AFA. Um, and, and I think it's it's those groups that are um, have a plan um, which may or may not involve pest managers. Uh, but that's a conversation for a little bit later on, I think. Um, but there we go. So how long so how long has it been with the BBKA now? Who? Me? In post? Yes. Yes. Three in post, months. In post. 
literally started on the 1st of February. Yeah. Hit the ground oh, running. Wow. And oh. a couple of days before I started, I took the opportunity. Well, it just so happened that the BBKA had a committee meeting. Uh, their monthly committee meeting happened to take place just a couple of days before I was due to start in post. So they asked me if I wouldn't mind, you know, doing starting a little bit earlier and being on that committee meeting. Um, and from that, I sort of identified some key people that I really needed to talk to. And I just got on the phone to them and had some really lengthy conversations. So I'd already spoken to some of the key players down in Kent who had done some really incredible work um, in terms of making contacts um, before I even started, which was really, really useful because then I could literally hit the ground running. I mean, I I sort of had in my mind um how I wanted to support the um associations in Kent and the surrounding area of course because you know it wasn't just Kent Kent we talk about Kent a lot but you know numerous areas along the south coast and elsewhere um I had an, an idea about some of the key players that that I wanted to contact who could help us with this and support um awareness raising in the area and then within the first day, I received an email from one particular person uh, at one association, one branch in Kent, who sent me uh, a Word document of all the people she'd contacted so far and completely took the wind out of my sails and stole my thunder because literally everyone that I had thought of and many, many more were listed as she, and she'd already done it. And, she, you know, it had already be, those people had already been reached out to with varying degrees of success. So I was, you know, I was taking something, particularly in that part of the country, that had already sort of, there was already that kind of sense of proactivity taking place. So it was so much easier for me to just come in and work with those people and really kind of strike up a relationship with them and, and you know, carry on the good work that already started. I'm going to be honest with you, you're sitting there saying that um, you you had a proactive list you thought you were doing well and then someone said ah i've done all this already i actually would take that as a huge compliment if that was me you know i've been in here two months i don't know the industry that well i've written a list and oh look at that every name that i've got is you know mm -hmm. this person who's been doing it for years and years i wouldn't take that as a fail i'll take that as a win personally yeah but in, in some respect you see i think but, but what i've come in thinking about this from and this was very much the message from the start was that we need to get across that this isn't just a beekeeping problem. That's what a lot of people said to me. It's a huge beekeeping problem, but this is not just a problem for beekeepers to take on their shoulders themselves. Everybody needs to be aware of this because it affects so many different areas in society and everybody needs to play their part in tackling it. So I think actually it was quite beneficial for me to come in from the point of view of not being a beekeeper as really just an average Joe member of the public. Okay, all right, so how do I make people who aren't beekeepers and don't understand the huge threat that the Asian hornet poses to honeybees and other pollinators and other insects, how do I make people sit up and take notice? How do I make them think, oh, okay, actually, I need to worry about this as well. And it's not just the beekeepers that need to worry about it. So actually, I think it's been in many ways beneficial because I've come at it from a point of view that's not just about beekeeping, actually. And I've sort of so tried to take a whole society-wide view of this a lost a holistic approach so with that i mean while while sean's just um flapping in the background there you say <laughs> that there's a lot of people involved with this and of course with um pest managers we see pest managers it's our industry we, we know pest managers um who else do you think should be involved in this conversation because of course we we, we feel excluded but you say that we need to bring a lot more people uh, around this table who else, who else are the, do you think are the big players that we need to start including in these conversations? How long have you got? Um, you well, we, we, we have an <laughs> hour and 15 minutes left, so I, long maybe? Um, if I were to say that I have identified, put it this way, there's, I've, got, I've got a workbook on my computer that currently there are about 250-odd individual potential partners and stakeholders that have been emailed now that covers everything this companies or industries yeah. or sectors this, what, 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 this ranges from well and and that's that's on a national scale i've then probably targeted about another 70 or 80 in kent on top of the ones that the, the guys in kent were already working on so it broadly kind of it broadly kind of can be categorized from my experience so far 
into about four separate areas. So you've got those who are perhaps uh, partners who have some influence in terms of they have a platform. So you're talking media groups. You're talking uh, organisations that perhaps have websites on which they in which they can um, publish an article. And let's be honest, in this digital age, pretty much every business and organisation has got a website and social media feeds. So you're talking about perhaps those influential ones like wildlife trusts, the RSPB, the National Trust, those that have digital platforms on which they can publish articles or publish things on their social media feeds, uh, influential personalities, so people like, you know, um, well-known conservationists or um, any kind of well-known TV personality who, you know, throwing a few names out, your Monty Don, your Marcus Warings, your Chris Packhams of the world, your Michaela Strackens, oh. those kind of people. Um, I, I know, I'm aware there's a name in there I probably shouldn't have mentioned. <laughs> I think I know which one it is. Let's not go there. Um, so you've got those potential stakeholders that can help raise awareness, mainly the media groups, the magazines, and there's so many of them. You've got your national press, you've got your local press, you've got specialist magazines, sport publications, sport and leisure, educational publications, all sorts. So that's kind of like the first category that that that, that I'm working on. The second one um, are any businesses, industries, groups, charities that own large areas of land that they need to be keeping an eye on, they need to be monitoring across um possibly trapping on so you're talking uh mod sites world estates parks woodland wildlife conservation marshland you know anything like that um golf courses randomly golf courses have been weirdly positive in their reactions to this they can't they're falling over themselves to get involved it's incredible i, I never knew but but there you go um so any kind of um part potential partners that that own large areas of land or manage large areas of land um and could be helpful in keeping an eye on on that land for asian hornets um you've then got those people who need to know about this for safety perspective so you've got those industries that will be most impacted by this outdoor workers, anybody working in land management, farming, tree surgeons, for education, education authorities that have forest schools, for example. Um, yeah, any outdoor workers um, and also the NHS, you know, really? um, oh, they're on my list. They're absolutely on my list because how many times have you sat in a dentist surgery waiting room or a GP waiting room waiting for an appointment that should have been half an hour ago and you're still waiting and you've got nothing to do except read the posters on the wall how many people could we get to if we had an asian hornet alert poster on a wall in a gp surgery uh, you know i have to say i, I avoid the doctors at all costs <laughs> you know it's it's full right. of sick people that's where all the germs yeah. are come I on know. You'll be lucky if you could get an appointment these days anyway, um, let alone one in person. But, yeah, absolutely. The NHS are on my list um, from, you know, it'd be interesting to know what their sort of plan is in terms of if we end up seeing, you know, injuries and, and harm to public health from this. Um, and mm. then the, the other category that it falls into are um, people or part, potential partners who could share the same ethos as all of us. So those who have an interest in wildlife, when you're talking about um, commercial enterprises, things like uh, Neil's Yard Cosmetics, Lush, Lush love running campaigns. You know, they, they, I think they have actually run a pollinators campaign in the past before as well. Um, or, and this is a little bit sneaky and a bit cheeky, but any business or organisation that sets to lose out financially by the establishment of Asian Hornets, if they've got something to lose from a profit point of view they could be and it is a bit cheeky but I'm not afraid to go there it could be a very lucrative person to have on board so when you sort of th those are kind of like the sort of four main category it falls into you know when you think about the fact that an Asian hornet nest could be underground we know they're built underground so that's something I've learned from John um they could be in a hedgerow I believe up in Yarm I think it was I think the one they found one in Yarm that was in a hedgerow that separated two houses where a young you know on a driveway where a young family lived you know when you think about the various sectors of society that could come into contact with a nest how many people there are that need to be told about this it's pretty much everyone so I would say the main players are those big recognisable um, 
names, a couple of which I've mentioned, places like the National Trust, um, the RSPB, um, you know, all the wildlife trusts absolutely have to be on board of local authorities. We have to have local councils on board with this. Um, and yeah, any, any, any body that can really help raise awareness as well. Um, we've had a real flurry of media activity in the last week or so. Fortunately, some of it hasn't been entirely accurate and we had to do a little bit of damage limitation because oh come on come on what was it you've got you've got to tell us what went wrong what went wrong um i think well i think the main one is always when they put a picture of the wrong hornet in the paper and it's still happening with alarming really? regularity um you know to the extent that that i I've, I've sort of spent a bit of time putting together a fact sheet which went around quite a few people to get it sort of okayed in terms of you know um with images and everything um and i've sent it all to, to all the major newspapers and all the major news desks just saying please make sure you use the right picture because the damage that can be done in getting that wrong it just yeah. undoes any good work in that might be gained by publishing an article in the first place you know so it, it still yeah. it happens it's it's bad when they put one up of the uh, the J uh, the giant oriental hornet, uh, yeah. the murder hornet uh, it's even worse when you occasionally see them put one up of the European hornet and yeah. you suddenly think oh, it was God. it was the European yeah. hornet and oh, it's just no. and the problem these days is is that everything's syndicated so so many of these newspaper groups that quite often there's just one big conglomerate you know company at the top and a number of different publications so when one runs it the same publication you know the same story goes out with the same inaccuracies and then other publications even if they're not run by the same people will pick up on it and go oh we'll just copy that and run the same thing and then because they're all connected it will go out on digital platforms as well and it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated um with the same inaccuracies to be fair it was a couple of red tops and they did they did put it right quite quickly once we got in touch so yeah sean's just put up a comment there do you want to read that one out sean because that's that's quite a lovely yeah. one Aww. I can see why Kirstein landed the job, impressive organisation and networking. <laughs> well done, Neil. Ne Neil's obviously single, but Kirstein's married, Neil, so stop with a, stop yes. with a slaver, all right? <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. That's very nice. I have had to, I'll tell you what, my um, my uh, <laughs> my skills with, with Excel were sort of, you know, basic at best before this, but my word, I've had to figure out how to get an Excel workbook in order really quickly. Because it is just, um, and every single time I think I've got most areas covered, um, utility companies as well. Utility companies, huge one, absolutely huge one. Um, you know, really? transport. Oh, I've got, I've got it. I've the problem with the utility companies is that they're quite difficult to find the right contacts for. So you imagine when you go on to, so I'm my local water company would be Anglian Water. If you go onto the Anglian Water website, you know they don't they tend not to list the contact details for the person who deals with environmental and sustainability issues they just give you the option if you've got to report a leak or if you want to talk about your bill so trying to get to the right department to talk about this i actually spent a lot of time just phone bashing and ringing up the customer service lines for all the different water companies and just saying yeah by the way i need to talk to you about the asian hornet and they were overjoyed because they were so used to dealing with people complaining about water leaks or sewage spills to have something, somebody come on and talk to them about hornets, they're like, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, yeah, I'll find the right person for you. But, yeah, getting getting contact details for, for things like utility companies, um, for the right person anyway, can be a bit tricky. So that's taken a bit of time. But, yeah, they're a huge one. Transport routes as well. Transport route is huge. Getting in touch with all the ports, ferry terminals, motorway service stations. Um, I think oh, somebody told me. I forget who it was, but somebody told me recently that the number one risk point in terms of access routes was actually timber freight. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's another big one that I've got to do, put a, put a bit See, of research all, into. All I'm hearing from this, and, and I want the pest managers listening to really take note, when you are trying to make contacts with your local authority, with your water companies, when you're scouting for business and when you're looking for, you know, routes in to speak to the people that you need to speak to, don't go through the switchboard. Just shout the word murder hornets down the phone until somebody picks up. Uh, I think that's, you know, that that's the big takeaway home for tonight, isn't it? Is is use the Asian hornets as a foot in the door. Um, yeah. But I, I can see Sean's absolutely busting and I'm I'm 
going to be Sean, this will be my last question, I promise. Yeah. But actually, with this, um, we're making such a fuss about Asian hornets. But as you say, the non-native species secretariat, there's a load of other species that have been coming into the UK and arguably much more damaging species in terms of economic and biodiversity loss. Um, why do you think people have got so hung up on the Asian hornet? That, you know, from, from, from your point of view? Um, is that for me or, or for Sean? Sorry. You. Sean as I well. Think, but for you. Sorry, I thought you were addressing that on Sean. Um, what, why do, why do I feel like everybody's worrying so much at the moment? Yeah, why? We've never seen this kind of outcry about, you know, we had yeah. a couple of years back the marmorated stink bug. We've had processionary pine and oak moths coming into the UK. Um, we've had uh, numerous uh, agricultural pests that have uh, washed across our shores and caused millions of pounds worth of damage to stored and, uh, you know, arable crops stored and, and in the field. Yeah. But we've never seen a campaign like this before. This, I is, think this, this is something special. Yeah, I think it's because this is a double whammy of threat, actually, because um, despite the fact that there's still an awful lot of um, naivety and ignorance out there about the importance of pollinators, I do think there has been a great effort in recent years to actually educate people on that front. And I think if you were to say to most people, are bees important? They'd go, oh, yeah, absolutely. A lot of the food we eat um, is completely reliant on pollinators. I think that much of information has actually seeped through because there has been a really um a really uh successful education and information campaign mm. in recent years to really bring people that, that level of knowledge up about the importance I mean, of pollinators so i think there is i think people still don't know enough really about the importance of them and there's still a worrying amount of people that can't tell the difference between a honeybee and a wasp and a wasp and a hornet <laughs> um uh that's why we need to uh, get on board with youth groups and youth education as well because actually they are, i think are with, without wanting to sound cliched and quoting a well-known song they are the future really and the, the the young will educate their parents and and you know the older generations so i think it's partly that partly the people do actually have a basic understanding of the importance of pollinators already and anything that threatens those pollinators and by lieu of that threatens their own existence and their own food source will seep through but you've also got the fact that you know that they're a threat to public health as well without wanting to scaremonger or overstate how dangerous they are it is worrying what we're hearing from elsewhere about how these insects can attack people if their nests are disturbed um and and the fact that um those nests could be built anywhere so i think it's this, this double whammy of threat actually that is worrying an awful lot of people and the sheer speed with which we saw what happened last year which took a lot of people by surprise. So I think it's like a combination of a lot of things as to why, why, and I think from a media point of view, it's like a perfect story, isn't it? I was talking to somebody about this the other day. It's absolutely the perfect story because of that kind of double whammy of, of, of sort of worry, actually. Um, and the media love anything that can look a little bit scary or do you know what I mean? Or where they can use the word invasion, you know? So um, from that point of view, I think the media have jumped on it. Um, perhaps not to the extent or in the way that we would like them to at times, but I think it has been a more appealing story for them than perhaps some of the other um, invasive species that, that you know, it, it, people inherently are quite selfish, aren't they? You know, I think even though people do understand that pollinators are important and if there's a threat to honeybee populations, then that's a really bad thing for our wider ecology. But actually, most people are inherently selfish. And if you say to them, these things are pretty nasty and you might get stung. And if you get stung by a lot of them, it could be bad. That's when people sit up and take notice. It's quite literally flying at your face. Oh, well, yeah. well, there we go. No, thank you very much for answering that. That's um, it, it that makes perfect sense. And I was just um, being a little tyke, I think, is the, the way of putting that. But Sean, come on, you you, you must have. Oh, yeah, you must have sure. Questions. What's the plans for the BBK to get the message out for, for 2024? We saw them spend a fair bit of money on buses or something, didn't we, down in Kent last year? Yeah. Um, and we've seen a guy dressed up in an Asian Hornet suit at shows. Like, what, what's going to happen in 2024? So, <laughs> you look like you wanted to interject there a little bit. 
no, no, no. I'm writing. I write because I no. Yeah, yeah. The bot. Yeah. So <laughs> with me, my brain goes so much. If I don't write it down, I'll just miss it. So every, I'm, I'm poised to write. <laughs> So, um, so what we're doing for 2024. So part of the plan is me, moi. Yeah. Funding has yeah. been put aside to create this post because um, I think there was a, a, a realisation and, a, and a, a recognition that, um, you know, the BBKA is a membership organisation. Any kind yeah. of fighting that the that, that, that individual beekeepers are doing yeah. um, um, is in their own time in the you know at their own expense often as well and I think there was an understanding that there was so much good stuff happening on an individual level well sometimes on an social on association level sometimes on a county level sometimes just on an individual level and actually I think we were finding a situation where a lot of people were going oh we need to contact this group and that group and this organization in that industry and actually what you had was an awful lot of duplication you had an awful lot of the same of people contacting the same groups so I think the idea behind me coming in or at least what I'm aiming to do and what my plan to do is is to kind of bring some cohesion to that and to work alongside those people and make sure we're not because people are going to grow very tired of hearing from us if everybody's just sending them letters and emails talking about the same thing <coughs> excuse me um so part of the plan is me um and I'm working sort of on three levels here. I'm working on a national level, reaching out to all of those hundreds of various different potential stakeholders that are sort of, you know, mentioned and sort of vaguely. Um, but also working on a more focused level in those alongside those counties uh, and those associations where they were really, you know, really saw those increases in nests last year. So around the, the South Coast and then on an individual level, literally in individual requests from associations and sometimes individual people who just need a point of contact for anything from I need some posters to put up at my local farmer's market. Where can I find them? Sometimes the, the hmm. questions are as detailed as I'd like to use this image in a leaflet. Can you tell me who 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 took it so I can get the copyright right? You know, some sometimes it's as detailed as that. So I'm I'm sort of going national, local, individual association. But what That's like you... specifically what what we're going to do in 2024? Like what are we gonna are we gonna do buses or what or what? How are, how is it going to get out there? I know we're going to try and speak to these people, but like what are we actually going to do? I'm I'm trying to get a number of different things on board, but the issue quite often comes down to cost. You know, that Asian yeah. Hornet costume had fantastic reach. It went down a storm at that show. Um, an awful lot of people interacted with it, engaged with it, um, but it wasn't cheap to create. Um, and it can only be kind of shared around, you know, a, a number of different places. And there are logistics about sharing it around the county, et cetera. Adverts on the backs of buses aren't cheap. You know, one of the things I tried to do was I reached out to some breweries um, and camera, the campaign for real ale. And also, I forget what it's the British Beer and the BBPA, the British Beer and Pub Association, um, another abbreviation. Um, and just said, look, you know, Asian Hornets could cause a real problem for beer drinkers in beer gardens this year so um can we partner up on a a, a beer mat campaign you know can would you be, team up with us and let us put the asian hornet watch qr code and an alert you know and a warning message on the back of beer mats um haven't got very far with it because sometimes it's it's people just mm -hmm are sticking their heads in the yeah. sand about it actually so yeah. a lot of so, these things uh, come down to cost yeah, yeah. So, and tedster whoever whoever tedster is um <laughs> makes a really interesting point which is we're talking about all these vehicles to get the message out there we're talking about the people we can talk to we're talking about yeah. the organization societies and everything else but actually what is the message because for so many years now the message has been this is what an asian hornet looks like a and still I, I find ourselves depressingly two you know two years into the uk and 10 years into jersey and you know however many years it's been into into france um and the message that we seem to be saying this is an asian hornet hasn't really struck home so is that 
the same message that we're giving out this year or are you looking for a different tact? What is the message on the beer mat? What is your, you know, on your post-it note? I think the message, I'm going back to that, people are inherently a little bit selfish and um, no, not selfish. It's about self-preservation. Yeah, they are. It's, yeah, well, they yeah, are. but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's most people want to ensure their own and the, the safety and the safety of their loved ones. So I, I, a lot, I mean, the message, the message varies depending on who I'm targeting. If I'm targeting tree surgeons, um, it's going to be very difficult, different to if I'm targeting the NFU, um, because people will be impacted by this in a different way. So I'm having to kind of skew the angle of whatever I say. But the, but the, the clear message is from, from what I'm hearing, from what the BBKA wants to get, the BBKA wants to get across. Conversely, is that this is not just a problem for beekeepers. This is something that will affect all of us. And that we need everyone to be on board with helping it. And people keep referring back to the Colorado beetle of years ago, which I can just about remember, just about, <coughs> um, that we need a public awareness campaign of, of, of the same level. Um, the challenge is, is that communications have changed drastically. And the way people um, engage with and consume information yeah. So. It's changed drastically as well, and you know, getting getting through to people that that they that this is something that matters to them when we're living through a cost of living crisis and everything. So it really is that this will affect everyone. This is how it might affect you, and this is what you need to do about it. Get the app and, and report what, it. It seems, doesn't it? Like, sorry, that one of the things that's clearly correct is that. There's a cost implication of everything we do. Mm -hmm. Like um, Ted has just asked a question there. How can we get your public to help? And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, like there's a number of things you've said, like people inherently a little bit selfish. I think that's true. I think it's fair to say that, you know, they want to protect them and their own. It's their own time and expense, etc. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the BBKA's posts, like beekeepers who I can remember Ian Campbell, who you know and I know quite well, there was a debate a little time ago, and um, I think it was um, Robert Moon who was involved in it, actually. And Ian's comment was, he said, it's because beekeepers have the most to lose. And I think he's right, it's clear. Yeah. But then when I look at the BBK's website, uh, Facebook page, it's like, if you look at the Asian Hornets, there's 10,000 members, five likes, eight shares. Next one, um, Asian Hornet, um, 10 likes, 12 shares. Like, how do we, or how do you, I guess, um, Asian Hornet, six likes, two shares. How do you get the BBK members of the main page and the association pages to, short, to, to start sharing that? Because if you get, yeah, apathy, Ted, that apathy, I think that's exactly the right word. Yeah. Like, the, as you said, they got caught out massively on the South Coast. And my concern and my worry is that it's going to happen in other areas and they're just yeah. going to run over with. So how yeah. do you get beekeepers to just to simply share that? Because then they reach. Like everybody knows a beekeeper. Yeah. Like how do one, we get beekeepers to actually get involved? One of the things I've asked members to do um yeah. is to get onto their community social media pages get on those facebook pages when i used to work in the media the first thing i was i was responsible for putting programs together the first thing i did on a monday morning i used to produce weekend yeah. breakfast shows the first thing i did on monday morning was i would go and look at the community social media pages they are the first places you go when you find out what's happening in your community that's just the way yeah. of the world these days so one of yeah. the first things i ask people to do is um Every couple of weeks, I'm putting together a communication with links to some of the main kind of posts that go out on BBKA social media, but also some of the uh, better, accurate articles um, uh, and stories that have been um, <coughs> in the media. And I just say, please get on your community Facebook pages and share them. Just get on your community Facebook pages and share yeah. them out there. And it's it's it, and people are starting to do that. Um, a lot of people are um now starting to get in touch with me and say well this is great but some of the government documentation some of the id sheets and everything that we're seeing don't have the qr code on them so can we get them to put the qr code on their posters so that we can then and it's it's you know the whole concept of making those links in the, the issue um the problem i've got is that 
it's just me working part time. Well, it's not just me. That makes it sound like yeah. I'm doing this on my own, and I'm not. Yeah, as a team yeah. officer, but as the outreach officer, I'm I'm working part time, and there's thirty thousand odd members of the BBKA. So I can't possibly get myself onto every single one of those yeah county community facebook Absolutely. pages to share the message i can only put the support system and network in place to help the associations do it themselves oh. so the first thing um well not one of the first things i did but one of the things i did was um there were already a number of fantastic resources that had been created, PowerPoint presentations, um, posters, all sorts of things. People had written letters to their MPs. People had um, compiled templates for urgent help to businesses and for funding and that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of identified some of the ones that I thought were, were, you know, really helpful. They were already out there because so many people had already gone to such lengths to engage with their community. And with their permission, um, I could put it all together in a communications package that went onto the website. I'm now working on going one step further and actually turning that into a communications plan, identifying the main key stakeholders in any given community that I that we think and with with support from other people and, and help from people down in Kent who've kind of been there and done it and seen who they need to reach out to and contact. That communications plan will hopefully go that one step further and help sort of guide people towards where they can use that communications package of resources so i have a thought it happens infrequently and usually is accompanied by the smell of burning electronics but with <laughs> that um we have a whole industry a whole community of pest managers who are champing at the bit to get involved and we know we know at the moment that we are not quite there yet but those amongst not us welcome are, are not there Blah 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 blah. blah. Um, we will cover that one in a minute. <laughs> but um, we have a whole. And if, if people are smart, we can still use this. And and to talk, you know, in, in very mercenary terms here, we can use this to advantages. We are pest managers. We are here to deal with pests. And although yeah. we are not yet welcome or yet invited, um, it would behoove a lot of pest managers to start spreading awareness of the Asian hornet to start using it as a a tool. You say sharing it on your community pages. Imagine pesties listening to this. If you went onto your community pages tomorrow or on Monday and you put a post up saying, hey, are you concerned it's an Asian hornet? Get in contact with me today. And they send you a picture and it's just a wasp. And you say, that's no Asian hornet. That's not a problem. I'll come around and deal with that tomorrow. Or that is Asian hornet. Report it to the website here. You can have a double whammy. You can support the program. You can support this Asian hornet watch program and simultaneously use this as a marketing opportunity. You can use this public um, attitude and fear to want of a better word of the Asian Hornet to your advantage and at the same time you can help you can help you can you can do two things use it as a marketing stream get on your community pages do posts on your own Facebook pages and share them about because this is you know it as Sean says 10,000 beekeepers on um one page and six shares <coughs> we can do better than that guys we regularly do better than that. You only have to put a picture of someone with a bait box with a key, you know, missing up on UK pest controllers and you have 1,400 likes on it and, you know, a lot yeah. of comments. So with that, let's get involved. Um, I mean, and, and Tesla says, we do try and help, but we get slammed by the MBU. What is your relationship with the MBU? Just out of interest. What is the um, BBK's relationship with the MBU? To, uh, I couldn't speak on behalf of the BBKA because I know... Um, I mean, I have only been in post for a couple of months. I have had um, I had a really good conversation with um, the MBU when I first started, really just because I was like, you know, I better just introduce myself, let them know what I'm going to be working on. Um, and they gave me some really good um, ideas of, of, you know, what they felt needed to be done. Um, one of which was please put together a communications package and, and, and you know, try and encourage the associations to use that in their own communities because um that's the only way you're going to do it you know it, we need to come from top down and bottom up at the same time um we need to go in at the top with the big national organizations and hope that you have the trickle down thing um i question to what extent that happens to be perfectly honest um i know it's happening in a lot of cases i know in other cases it's not i've put a lot of time and effort into um 
liaising with some big organisations, passing over information. I've even written articles for some that they can put on their websites. And I know for a while they never got published. And you think, OK, are you just paying me lip service because you just want to get me off your back? So we need to go. We do know we need to go in the top and hope it trickles down. But also we need to be going bottom up. We need to be coming in right on a community level, finding those local community contacts and hoping that they then take the issue up the chain of command, so to speak. So um, I've forgotten what your original question was. <laughs> I went off on a so tangent. What? I'm about to say, what what is the relationship with the MBU? Because I think oh, a lot yeah, of sorry. people listening to this, a lot yeah. of people listening to this, will erroneously lump the BBKA yeah. and the MBU uh, under the same hat. Yeah. And that's so I'm, I'm going to go further than that. I think the vast majority of the public believe that the BBKA are responsible for the fight of and have no idea that it is the MBU. Um, I could probably I couldn't really comment on that. Um, yeah, no, like I get I say, it. I've 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 come into this mm. at a time when an awful lot happened last year. Um, an awful lot of very good connections were made, but I appreciate and have picked up on the fact that there's probably certain frustrations about the way certain things are happening. Um, I've had, like I say, a good conversation with the MBU. Aside from that, my only real dealings with them have been a few queries that I've had here and there about whether or not they have to be fair, Kirstine. I don't, I don't time. expect you to 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 slay them. I'll do that. Like I don't expect you to comment either because I understand you have a job and it's with the BBK. Yeah, but I'm going to do. I personally don't have any reason to slate them because, like I say, I have a conversation where at the beginning where I said, "Okay, what what do you do? Um, this is what I'm planning to do," and they went, "Great. If you could do this, 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 and this, we think that's where you need to focus your attentions." So they very much said, if you could focus some attentions on transport routes in particular, but also providing the associations with that kind of communications guidance so they can raise awareness in their own communities. Beyond that, literally, the only dealings I've had with so them what, have what, been to what are the them. MBU? So the BBK are trying to get the message out. What are the mm-hmm. MBU doing to try and get the message out? I couldn't tell you. I honestly, I, I, you I, don't I, know. I don't know. Because, or because I, I haven't been focusing in all honesty, I had that initial yeah, yeah. contact with them, but to be perfectly honest, no, no, I, listen, I get it. You do your thing, and you let's yeah, be fair, you've got a part time yeah. job and, have, and you're you flat know, out I, doing your in, thing. In the spirit of cooperation and collaboration, yeah. I did say, I did I get, get in touch that. and say, I'm no, no, here I as this. That. And there have been yeah. communications where they've yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Have you thought about this? And I've said, Can you help me with this? And see, you know, some, yeah, but some, I know see, that, like, but some of my concerns, like, are the following like i read their document the asian the yellow-legged asian horn thing and it said that they're supposed to send out an email if you're within 20 kilometers of a i didn't get no email i've never had a notification from them i never never once and in fact when you said about that nest and yarn it's the first i've heard of it and i my my apri site is probably a mile from where it was found like i've got no knowledge i i know sorry I know it was in Yarm. I don't know where. I don't know what's going on. Like I've never been asked to deploy traps. I've never been asked to to put anything out. And my my worry is that Hugh Hugh said it. He said apathy. The word apathy. And I think that if we do not get the MBU to get the BBK involved on the ground, then what will happen is it will turn to apathy from the beekeepers, and we'll end up in a position where the beekeepers are not getting involved because it's like, well, they're dealing with it. And then everyone's looking to the BBKA. So if the MBU are watching, I think, MBU will be watching, I guarantee you, I think that getting beekeepers involved more on the floor and stirring up their interest in it can only be a good thing rather than putting a fire on there, putting a, a damp rag on their fire, for want of a better word, you know. There's a comment here. For, he, and this, this is the concert, like, my worries. You've got Hugh put a comment on five already this year and information from the MBU that wants to reach 200 nets um, will drop. Stay vigilant. Like, this is just to everyone. Like, stay vigilant. First comment was, like, I'm going to threaten you with reporting you to Nigel Sebeds. And then later on, like, this for me is just... And I think, what the hell? Where is it? Where is he right? Um, let's have a look. Yeah, I don't understand how being on a podcast about Asian Hornets and everybody listening as a member of the Asian Hornet page, who are we elevating awareness to? Like what? So people should stop. Like we're trying. Like please don't mm. beat us with a stick for trying to help you. 
like we i would love to be able to get involved and actually and i look and i think we've got ten thousand members of the bbk however many on that page however many in the local associations like we need to find the right people i yeah. do not believe for one second that if we put it out and said like can anyone help us get a contact in the Southampton docks? I think I've got one, by the way, for the lady who contacted us. I've got a pest controller down there who might be able to help. Mm -hmm. um, Teesport. I know the guy who, who runs Teesport. I'm going to have a word with him during the week to see if we can get out there. We've got this massive workforce. And then, like, you come on and you seem to, Hugh said it, like getting beat, hit by a stick by them. How do we get over this us and not us and them but this little bit of antagonism and get everyone to work together like what can we do what can the members of the public do in order to really push the message forward and get it out that we need to be looking for asian hornets how do we do that it's a huge task i'll say that much yeah. um yeah I mean, that's part of the reason why I've been brought in. And it's a, it's it's when you think about it, it's a weird kind of situation that the BBKA has stumped up the funding to bring on board somebody because I, I, I kind yeah. of straddle two sort of responsibilities here. One is to do the outreach on a on an external scale um, and target all of those big organisations. Um, and you're literally talking about pretty much every single aspect of society. You are talking about yeah. the whole social spectrum here. This could affect yeah. anyone and everyone. Um, so that's an awful lot of people and places to, to contact. But at the same time, I'm I'm funded by the BBKA. So I have a responsibility to mm -hmm. the beekeepers to support them in whatever way they feel they need to, to further their own interests. That, that's what I'm here yeah. for, to support them and, and back up their efforts to raise awareness of this. Um, uh, it, it, we're getting there. I mean, it's it's a huge yeah. task, but um, there is a huge amount of information sharing going on. There is a huge amount of um, um, sort of connecting the the dots, and and you know, we've got great relationships now with with Jersey, um, with the Isle of Wight. Huge amounts of knowledge that's been shared and passed over to us, um, and it is just about getting it out beyond there. But but so many individual beekeepers and, and beekeeping associations are working really hard on this they are going to their local yeah. shops they are putting you know they're putting up posters at their local farmers markets when they're selling their their products they're sharing stories on their social media on their you know community social media pages um and and we are starting to get there because i think I don't think the media would have picked up on this story and run with it in quite the way they did over the last few weeks if they didn't think the public were interested in it. I so think the public are massively interested. Sorry, go on, Lex. That's what I'd say. So we, you, you've spoken about um, talking to these various associations. Have you made contact and have you, I, I know there's been some contact, but I mean, with the BPCA or the MPTA, so the trade associations within the pest management sector, um, I'm sure they would be more than happy to assist in this. I mean, have, have, <laughs> you, have, you, have you managed to, to have any good They're on my list. <laughs> On your list. They're on my list. I'm working my way through, but they are absolutely on my list. I mean, when, so I'll help Kirsteen out here. Yeah. She has spoken, yeah, well, we she has spoken really to pest controllers because she spoke yeah. to Dr. Matt. So she yeah. has. And Dr. Matt's really obviously like Alex and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. But, but, Kirsteen, like you're doing say, better than you think. <laughs> but like I say, like, you know, when I came into this post, I had this what I thought was quite a long list of all the people that needed to be contacted. And every single day, yeah. someone gets in touch and goes, have you thought about this? And I go, oh, that's a huge one. I didn't think of that one. Um, and I had thought about pest controllers, but, you know, Sean and I, when you invited me to do this, you know, we had a really long chat on the, on the phone mm. and I was brought up to speed with how the pest control community feels about their place in all of this and what they want their place to be in all of it. And I totally, totally get it. And I don't think that we've, well, no, I won't go so far as to say that because I don't want to be defeatist. But our best chance of tackling this is to work together. And there has to be a collaborative Agreed. approach, which means I think anybody who might have to play a part in dealing with this in the future should have a seat at the table. I agree. We have been, but, we've been saying this for a little while. But I am not party to those conversations that happen within the higher ranks of government departments. Um, I, I'm not 
knowledgeable about the reasons why certain decisions are made um, and I wouldn't profess to be so I can't sit here and say it's not right that it's been done this way or that it should be done that way but I think it's a bit of a no-brainer that at least communicating collaboratively can only be a good I thing. Think, I think the one thing I'd like to say is that it's quite clear that without the BBK here this message would not have got out do you know what I mean? Like before, and this was this was why I said I don't think that people realise the BBK are not involved in it because of the conversation that we you may said we're involved because we've got the, the most to lose. I presumed that they were, and mm. then you would say stuff and I think what's going on? Yeah, like what's going on? And then later on it was like, wait, I'll tell you what happened? They turned up and they turned up in Yarm, and um, there was a because they turned up, we've done some digging. And what I got told of beekeepers was that they were basically everything was shut down. They wouldn't tell anyone where anything is. It was absolute secret squirrel stuff. Um, they weren't allowed to come in and help with the track and trace. They were basically told, go back to your apron, put out a monitoring trap and sit and watch it. And I was like, what? And then and then you find out <laughs> not only that, but the BBKA are using their own funds to push us out. It's not government funded. It's a member organization. Mm. and they're pushing it out and they've employed someone and they seem to be the bbk seem to get the stick that they didn't deserve because actually like when you stand back and look at it the work that they've done has been phenomenal like absolutely phenomenal there's no getting around it yeah and they are I... getting it in the neck for the stuff that the mebbies that, that that they have no right to yeah. to get involved yeah. in but they're getting it i mean i think it's fair to say that you know when you're talking about a countrywide um yeah. membership association that represents tens of thousands of people um there will be understandably variation in opinion like for instance where i live i'm fairly certain there's only been one sighting of an asian hornet now i'm not going to put down my local bka but i think it's fair to say they're probably not well i know they are now doing quite a lot to raise awareness but they probably wouldn't um have the same opinion about what needs to be done and how quickly um as kent for example and then you talk about you know other associations and so there'll be difference of opinion about the mbu's role in this how you know government departments are um communicating with the bbka how the bbka should best but you know you're going to get huge differences of opinions um when you're talking about a countrywide association that that, that represents that many people yeah. um what i can say is i know of because i've had conversations with them people who are literally working around the clock on this in some of those yeah. real red zone areas uh, in so, terms of the number of nests last year just absolutely working their socks off and i've actually done me a favor by getting some really useful links and contacts and ways mm -hmm. into big companies that i hadn't managed to get because i didn't have that that name and that you know that person that i could get in with so uh i'm we've got roughly about 20 minutes left now i want to go back to a, a previous comment and that, that you'll see why in a second mm -hmm. because of course asian hornet is arguably a pest it falls into one of those three categories it can um cause you know damage disease and distress and definitely the damage and uh, distress is, is is a big factor in this so arguably it is a pest it definitely is a pest mm -hmm. and we are pest managers um and so with this i this and again it sounds like we are playing an old song here but I think there's a lot of misconception by the general public, by a lot of these other organizations as to what pest managers are. And there's going to be a lot of people just like you who are tuning into this podcast for the first time because they're not listening to it because it's a pest managers thing that they're talking about. They're listening to it because it's a bee thing, because it's an Asian Hornet thing. And so with this, and and I'm going to, I'm so <coughs> sorry, Sean, I saw you, I, I noticed you noticed this and then swiftly bypass it. But what I'd like, just for a couple of minutes, if that's all right, can you ask some questions to us about <laughs> pest management? So, no, no, I think it'll be quite useful to try and dispel because we had Trevor on on the first week mm -hmm. and he was yeah. absolutely blown away that so many pest managers were beekeepers and that we did so much work to remove honeybees, yeah. like live removals of honeybees. Um, yeah. John was the same last week. And, and, you know, well, Jason was a little different because he, he straddles both those camps anyway. So I think it might be useful just to potentially ask us some of the misconceptions i mean and be brutally honest you know well what... i think i think one of i think one of the one of the questions that would have sprung to mind for me to ask you is what do you think the misconception is in terms of when people think of the word pest 
actually, in terms of the actual creatures and critters that you're dealing with. Because if you're dealing with something that if you, you do with, do you deal with unwanted bees? I, um, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, bees yeah, are yeah. good in my book. So, you know, what, how do you feel about the misconception around the actual word pest? And do you think the public actually knows what you deal with? Or do they only ever think about, I don't know, rats and cockroaches? Can, can I jump in here, Sean, and then you, you can give yeah. me your opinion. So Sean and I come from two different spectrums within this um, industry. <laughs> I, I've, I've come from a manufacturing and uh, consultancy, and Sean's just been doing it. He's just been, been getting on and doing it. Um, but when I give the lectures and the rest of it, it's... Um, I, I like to say a pest is very much like a weed. If you, you can have the most beautiful rose bush in the world, but if it's growing out of the middle of your patio, then you don't need it and don't want it to be there. And it's causing more harm than it is good. That is what a pest is at the end of the day. A pest can mm. be any animal, any animal that has the capacity to spread disease, to cause damage or to create distress in the general public. And, and it means that you know, take a rat, for example, because they're fairly easy to understand. A rat in someone's house, arguably, understandably a pest. But I think where a lot of people don't understand is they think <coughs> that pest controllers and pest managers see all rats as pests. We don't. The rats that live out in the fields, live out in the forests, live out in the boondocks and far away from us, there's no disease, there's no damage, there's no distress that is affecting us. And so mm. we don't consider those pests. We're, our job is not to go out and, you know, um, crush, kill and destroy at all costs. It is this pruning of that rose bush in order to make sure that society is safe. And yet at the same time, it's not to destroy every single pest. So when you say, are bees pests? Well, arguably, when they're doing bee things out in the fields and out in the woods and in people's apiaries, Absolutely not. When they're all cuddled up in the wall of a hospital, absolutely yes. Mm. Absolutely yes. And so, so that's the distinction for so me. It's more home and area management, really, than just targeting pests. I mean, Sean, uh, bring, what's your opinion on this? Um, I just think that the, <clears throat> from a boots on the ground point of view, it, it's quite simple that people are nimbies not in my backyard so like when you i've had i've had customers say to me you don't kill the rats do you not in someone's house like yeah you, you wouldn't kill them would you the same people when they've got rats in their loft are like kill them kill them now so mm. i don't i don't tend to get involved in that side of it um i think the comment of something that's detrimental to human health is absolutely true bees are incredibly good but they are a stinging insect. And if you've got the chance of your children, in, bees are the prime example, aren't they? Don't kill bees. They can live in your chimney. They're absolutely fine. Just leave them alone. Leave them where they are until honey's running into your living room, until your kids are being stung in the garden because they've sat mm -hmm. on one on a flower or what have you. And then all of a sudden you want them, you want them out. I think there's a role for doing our job responsibly. Um, and yeah. the older you get, the more important you realise that is. But I don't, yeah, I think... I personally believe that a pest is exactly as Alex said. It's a weed. A thistle growing in the middle of your lawn is a pain in the arse. A thistle growing in the countryside, on the hillside, is a beautiful flower to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just how it affects us, isn't it? That's what I think it is. Yeah. But, yeah. And you, you might notice as well, um, I taken to so i refer to the pest controllers um more often <clears> not as pest managers because i believe there's a big distinction in our industry pest control is this little thing this little thing that is the pointy end of the stick that is doing the thing you know killing the rat in the loft for example pest management is actually what we all are um our industry is pest managers because a vast majority of what we do and a vast majority of what we try and get people to do is to try and make there be an environment where there are not pests in the first place. We mm. have so much skill and knowledge to prevent pests, preventative action. Pest control is the reactive part of our industries. The re you know, we get called in when there is a problem. If people actually it hired pest managers before there was a problem, then there may never need to be a problem. There may never need to be that need mm. to uproot that weed if you take our advice and put down anti-weed netting in the first place. It's a real oxymoron in our industry that we have so much more to give in terms of prevention, but nobody seems to approach us for that. It's only ever when it is in my backyard, when it is this, a problem this, to someone. This is this is the biggest problem. And I have I have um 
I have t- when I first started in this post, I, I it kept I kept being reminded of what happened with COVID, and that it, we saw it coming down the train. We saw we coming we saw it coming down the train tracks. We saw it coming down the train tracks. Actually, okay, we only care about it when we get sick or when our neighbour gets sick. And do you know what I mean? And then it was there, and then it was spreading. Um, and you know, we we knew that it was happening, but as a country, mm-hmm. we didn't do anything about it in time. Um, and it I've feels- said this since this year, though, Kirstine. I've I've said this since this year. I think they're here. I think they're established. Um, I think they are going to hurt several industries. But I also believe that um, it will only become a problem when it is in their backyard. And that's for beekeepers and members of the public. But it's quite interesting to look. And I'm going to take these ideas and say they were mine. So if your name pops up here, you're not responsible, Gillian Turner. You know, great in primary school. Kids are sponges. They'll educate the parents. Yeah, you know, um, could a package be put together that includes info and a trap or two that families could purchase and get involved with in their own gardens? Could be interesting for kids to monitor their traps during the summer holidays. I think what a brilliant, brilliant solution! Like yeah. with the now BBK having sorry, go on. No, that's, sorry, now that's a great idea. And I had yeah. conversations with people. A number of people have sort of kind of mentioned a similar thing. The problem that you get, and this is what I have spent. Uh, um, an awful lot of time trying to tread very carefully around is that as soon as you're getting into the realms of anything bbka branded that then encourages trapping we then make ourselves responsible for what what might ever happen to those not those people who don't have experience with this thing so this is what i'm finding (coughs) you know i've been reaching out to say for instance Mm vineyards in kent could have an awful lot to lose with this when you see what's been happening in europe in terms of how that industry has had to change its working practices what we're hearing um in order to get around the risk of of asian hornets during the day at vineyards they've got a huge amount to lose from this um and some of them have positively responded saying yes i'd be really keen to sort of do something take some action on my land but you know making sure they've got everything they need to make sure that the responsibility doesn't then fall on us or me as an individual yeah if somebody ends up getting hurt because we're asking them to put out bait stations or traps you know it's a very and a lot of people had said to me in the early days we could get we could get something going like an insect watch in schools it'd be fantastic and then somebody went no no no, we don't want to go there actually because that is not do you know what i mean we can't be putting t- children potentially in that situation but once as always there's a huge amount of variation of opinion o- over that as to sort of how far we should be asking so, people yeah but so, sometimes surely we've just got to grab the bull by the horns and if yeah. it's got to that point where we're saying we're not doing it then for me you may as well just give up and admit defeat yeah like, and that's why because... documentation has been drawn up that i can officially yeah. put in my communications to these external partners now who aren't beekeepers because you know in an ideal world, if if um, I don't know a wildlife trust somewhere got back in touch and said, uh, "Yeah, we really want to, um, you know, set up traps around our site." Well, what I would do in an ideal world is I'll team them up with their local beekeeping association and I would make sure yeah. that they were there to support and provide guidance. But these, you know, we simply don't have the manpower to do that on the scale that we need to get people involved on a nationwide level. So what we have to do is give them the correct documentation, the correct risk assessment templates that they can go away and do their own and basically make sure they take responsibility for whatever they're doing, um, you know, and and having to bear in mind that these guys aren't beekeepers. So they've got no idea what a bait station is or what it involves or unless we give them all the correct and thorough documentation to make sure it can be done safely. So yeah, I just think that the, the, educating kids is going to be so important because I, I believe the here and if the here then we need to think not about the next 12, 12 months but the next 20 25 30 30 years and kids are sponges and they do absorb it so it's like yeah um i i, I would love to see that rolled out you could have a like share like share look couldn't you yeah. so like the post share the post look for asian yeah. hornets and ask I, all your members, please and please get involved in the Like Share Look campaign. Yeah, I'm in contact with the Scouts. They want to have a conversation. I've got a meeting lined up with the UK School Sustainability Network next week to talk about how we can get projects in schools. 
I'm hoping that we can get projects in schools. But again, it, that might need to be done on a local level and that will all come down yeah. to the time that, that, that people have in their own communities I, to dedicate to that. And there is a huge amount of work already taking place in schools. There's an awful lot of talks happening. I, say, I, I know a lot of I know a lot of pest managers who do open days and I'm sure a lot of the folks mm -hmm. doing here will do open days and uh, careers fairs and the rest of it. And not to mention the fact that almost every single school will have a pest management contract going there mm -hmm. anyway. It's probably worth, I would have to say, not in Teesside. Out... <laughs> well, it, do you even have schools in Teesside? I mean, oh, I do. The, the, yeah, the, the vast majority of schools in Teesside don't have a, yeah, it doesn't have a mate. There's a handful, it... but the vast majority just like ring you in when they've got a terrible problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, there, I, you just pissing on my parade here, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the civilized world like to protect their children from. Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, yeah. but yes, I, I believe that actually, okay, there, there, there probably is maybe a, a, a passing majority of schools will have a pest management contract in mm -hmm. place. So there will be a pest manager who will undoubtedly want to get involved with this, and so mm -hmm. maybe maybe reach out to them because mm -hmm. they would love to sort of like talk and do the rest of it i'm sure many of them would yeah. especially sort of like considering if it's a li little local school they probably do all of the wasp nests they probably do all of the rest of it for all of the parents around the schools anyway you know if you guys are savvy guys listening to this get involved it's another way of getting your face out into the local community um uh, whilst at the same time helping a really important project so you know two birds one stone please don't pass these opportunities up no and i just i just Sorry, I'm just looking at Gillian's no, comment no, no, no. there. Makes, Gillian makes a really good point there, where she says it's better to observe hornets on a monitoring station than running away from a disturbed nest. Absolutely yeah. agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. And that is the, the the difficult situation that we kind of find ourselves in. Um, in that this isn't just a pest that's a damp that, that's dangerous to wildlife. It, it can be dangerous to us as well. So it, it's I've got to be very, very careful about the position that I put the BBKA in when asking potential external partners to get involved on a more active level. But that's an absolutely correct point. If we don't do that actual monitoring and trapping on the ground, um, and that's why identifying those, you know, large landowners, um, you know, the... the Again, hang on a second. Like, I just, I keep... I keep going back to this thing. Why are the BBKA put, being put in the position where it is them that have to go to the schools when all the schools run a curriculum that's set by the government to do what they're supposed to, and it's the government's job to deal with this? Like, why, why, why are we constantly looking to the BBKA for the answers? A, a, a member organisation when you have governments who will have dealt with these sort of things they, well because you like you say it, isn't it yeah because beekeepers have an awful lot to lose from this so you know the bbka has identified a role and a need yeah. uh, of the outreach officer which can hopefully try and help limit the impact on its beekeeping members i think, I um, think what and, sean's saying Sorry, he's he's saying that it, the from an outsider's point yeah. of view, it's only the BBKA that is being proactive yeah. about this. Yeah. You're the only ones. It, it's a positive thing to the BBKA. We're not seeing any information coming anywhere else, and it's not to, yeah. it's not because you've got a vested interest. There are many other parties out there that yeah. do have a vested interest in the survival of bees and the eradication of the Asian hornets, and they're doing nothing, absolutely yeah. nothing, to get the message out there. Uh, yeah. So this is you know praise in a kind of backhanded way that <laughs> you are the only. No. only ones to be doing something yeah when and, and I'm, pleased, I'm pleased i'm pleased that that, that 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 we are being seen to be doing something i can only assume that it comes down to the fact that money is tight everywhere money is tight within the government i you know i well, don't yeah, I, no, I, get, I, I get that but when you've got uh nnss because they have dealt with lots and lots of um invasive species coming into this country and then they have all that knowledge that they that they could use. They have all those connections in every school going, in every port, in every place that you want to get into. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, by the way, the BBK is going to employ Kirsty in part time. She's going to deal with this. And I'm like, 
and then the BBK and get it in the next. It's like you could have done this and you could have done a trapping and yeah. what you should have sent this out. You should, and I think they should be doing this, giving it to you and going, can you roll this out for us? But it's not. It's like over to you guys. And I, I just, I get so frustrated because we've slipped into it so many times. It's like, so Kirstine, half a day, um, part-time lady, how are you going to solve the Asian Hornet problem in the UK <laughs> this year? It's not fair. It's, it's not even close. Well, I, I would, I, you know, I wouldn't like to suggest it's, um, it's, it's only me, but I do absolutely see your point. And yeah. I don't, I don't know the answer to it. Um, yeah. You know, how many, you how many times, answer. how many times have there been situations in the past where, as a country, we we probably should have in, been in a better situation to deal with? Yeah. I, I, I bring, I come listen, back to prove listen, it. Listen, the truth is, the truth is, is I'm saying this. down the line, and, I, I, and we don't I'll, respond. Yeah, I'll try and help you out. The, the reason why I'm saying this isn't because I expect you to to answer or to, to slag them off. I don't. I'm saying this because I'm absolutely positive that they are watching this. And I pray to God that they'll turn around and they'll go, he might be a bit of a prick and he might have called us a few names, but actually maybe we could. Maybe we could help. Maybe we could do this. I just, you know. So I'm not I'm not trying to drop you in it. I'm just hoping that the MBU sees this and goes, actually, please let why don't we try and get the beekeepers involved? Why don't we try this? So I don't expect you to comment on it at all. I'm just I, get me frustrated. I will go so far as to say that there are efforts to raise awareness. I was yeah. in touch, you know, you know, from those government departments. I I, I can't sit here and say they're not doing anything because just this week, I don't know if I can talk about it, but at the moment, because it's still a bit hush hush, but just this week I was asked to take part um, in an awareness raising um, event, a big one. At which <laughs> this could... is brilliant. Is I'm going to second. There was an awareness event. That's hush hush. <laughs> um, well, because it's, it hasn't, basically my ticket hasn't been bought yet, but I've been basically invited right. along to quite a big event at which I, I have seen a huge amount of work has gone into uh, what mm. is going to be public facing at this event in terms of Asian Hornet awareness. A huge mm. amount of effort and no doubt money. It's very impressive. And they, in the spirit of good working relations, have reached out and personally invited me to be with them at that event. So, you know, um, money's tight. In, throughout government and, and I, you know I see comments coming through saying it's how they choose to spend it absolutely but you know there are um, demands on government funds and central funds all over the place so I appreciate your frustrations um, uh, I agree that for the BBKA to, to sort of take responsibility and spearheading a nationwide campaign as fascinating yeah. as I'm finding it and as much as I'm loving the challenge um, is a bit skewed um, but I have seen that there is a lot of money and a lot of effort in in, in government departments going. I just in. think I just think the BBK needs a massive pat on the back for what they're doing, but they're getting a little bit shot in the foot, which is, you know, it is what it is. But and we're glad you're here. Oh, I'm glad. You, are you glad? Well, you're glad <laughs> well I, I I haven't. You see, I haven't been on the receiving end of any of that shooting in the foot. You see, so I'm I'm aware of the fact that there are. And have been because of the way things played out last year, um, some mm. tensions um, and some disagreements, and there always will be. Um, yeah. You know, um, so yeah, but I, I haven't been on the receiving end of any kind of criticism towards the BBKA about anything. Yeah. So I don't. No, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, though, this is this for me is the thing that we have to change. This is, and it's you know, it's pie in the sky. It's right for me to sit here and see we need to do this, but I'm not involved, isn't it? But, um. Someone who looks up Asian Hornets every day, I've seen nothing online. I honestly believe we need to get it to a point where when you go on your Facebook feed, there will be something which pops up which says yellow-legged Hornet, Asian Hornet, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't happen. And I believe that the BBK, if they can mobilise their members, I think that would happen, you know. I think. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I, I mean, social media is a huge tool. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Wayne, for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm two months in i you know and i um uh yeah um yeah. i have i have to be but you know that's not that's not a deliberate attempt to kind of 
sit on the fence or anything. It purely is just because actually my experiences with various different people in various different departments have just been on the whole pretty positive. And all I've got to go on really is what I hear from guys like yourselves in terms of there's frustrations about why we're not involved in this way or there's frustrations about the way, you know, this department is carrying out this. Um, I can only really remark on what I've seen. And as somebody who's kind of sort of taken this what I hope in sort of a different direction on kind of a national front. And then I'm sort of um, a lot of my efforts have been approaching groups and industries and organizations that are beyond the beekeeping world and they are beyond the MBU with the NNSS, etc. My only dealings with them have actually been to sort of ask for a bit of advice or ask for whether or not they've got this resource or this PowerPoint or this video in their arsenal that they could share. Um, everything else has been outward facing for me thus far, actually. So. I do I do wonder if this becomes true, that at some point the politicians will catch on to this and then all of a sudden they'll be putting on posts so that they look environmentally friendly and they'll be last to the last to the party again. But I guess we'll hmm, we are we are we are getting much. there with um there there is one particular association who um got in touch with me um about a month ago now um because they had managed to secure a meeting with their local mp and wanted to talk through how you know how we should best sort of target this and we had a you know we had a good chat and i gave them my opinion about what i thought we needed to be saying in terms of why local authorities and why local councils could find themselves really struggling with this if it's not nipped in the bud you know the impact that there could be on communities um and you know they really good made some good headway with that particular mp who has now promised to go and raise it further up the chain um you know so but it's it's kind of like little it's little wins at a time and and you know how far that will go it's been it's been suggested that it'll be you know raised as a debate in westminster time will tell my contact has been passed on i'll be quite happy to talk about it further yeah well thank you for everything you do uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> like I say, it, it, it sounds as though we've given you an absolute grilling, but it has come from a place <laughs> of support. And our frustrations, as we say time and time again, uh, we are more than just the crush, kill and destroy of, you mm. know, industry. We are, mm. we want to be proactive. We want to be at the forefront. We want to help. You know, I think it's what I, I, the biggest misconception is, is that we like to kill things. No, we like to help people. That is probably the biggest yeah. misconception of the pest management industry. We like to help people, not necessarily kill animals. Um, and, and the two don't necessarily have to go hand in hand, although they usually do overlap. Um, and and so that's I think that's our frustration. We just want to be at the table because we have a lot to give. We have a lot to to to, to bring to it. But I think this is bringing us um, quite neatly now around to the the one hour thirty mark. Would you have thought we've been talking for a, for an hour and a half? It doesn't feel like it, does it? No, no. no. It's been great talking to you. It's been a really great series, actually. Um, and just hearing have you, you know, them all. Uh, I haven't had a chance to watch them all. You, <laughs> sir, and so. <laughs> you so and so i did catch up with Bronze and i did catch up with jason but i did i did miss the first episode um but i will go back and watch it because you know i've had some i've had some really good conversations with them john has been so 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 generous with his time um but i learned so much just from watching his episode last week um i'm learning all the time um mm. you know so um i will go back and watch the first episode i promise <laughs> and to be fair i need to stress one of our first guests um was robert moon mm. so for those who aren't aware there's a bit of a love here just a hate relationship with robert and jersey and what have you but his his podcast is absolutely interesting isn't it about yeah. the way he sees it from the dealing with them in France perspective, et cetera, et cetera. So there's there's four in this one. But if you go back to the very start, there's another one, isn't there? Um oh. I think I think what are we up to now? I think we've got to be well into the twenties, approaching thirties in terms of podcasts now, haven't we? We've mm -hmm. been doing this since well, we've been doing it. We we did it badly last year on Facebook Live, uh, and we were doing one a week since I think about October, and then we started doing it on Streamyard January first or or Christmas Eve, wasn't it, or something like that. So there's oh, a lot yeah. of there's a lot of material back there. If you want to listen back and learn how you know everything from lawyers talking about housing dilapidations through to um, you know who are some of the other ones we've had on that we've had loads. We, we've had ecologists on. We've had yeah, so fumigation. Had, fumigation. Yeah. Rats and drains, birds, we've had all sorts on them. 
we've had a lot of different things on. So yes, uh, listen here, it's not just the Asian Hornets and miniseries. We've got a lot on there, a little bit for everyone. We've got some good ones lined up, actually. I think we've got some people from some debt collection agencies. We may, and we were, you know, we may have Mr. Alan Buckle, previously of Crew, on here. We're just waiting for that to get confirmed. We've got lots of people on, but I think to, to, to close up tonight, we've You've seen these before, so you kind of must expect what's coming up. Just, next. Hang on a second, just before you go oh. through them three questions, because that is the end. Kirstine, <laughs> I would strongly suggest that you speak to this man here, Clive Stewart. He's a good friend mm -hmm. of mine, so mm -hmm. full disclosure, know him really well. Um, he's from the UKB, all the UKB removers. Um, says a massive thank you. They've, they've sponsored this mini series, but what you will find, especially towards the end of the year. If there is any Asian hornets, the thought of honey being broken, um, at the moment we get a lot of wasps which will turn up late in the year and start robbing with other honeybees. But it might, I'm sure Clive would get involved in some sort of um, campaign with you, with the UKBR for them to to try and get that message out, especially later in the year when we start, when there's a potential chance of them turning up on site, um, you know. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's my like, share, and look campaign might might work there. I've made a note. Yeah. In fact, Clive, can you get in touch with Kirstine? Cool. Clive. Yeah, he will. Yeah. yeah. He will. Clive, Clive, pay attention, Clive. Um, <laughs> yeah. There. <laughs> there we go. Clive, so, do you, do you do you want to do the first one or shall I? Shall I? Uh, no, I'll go for the first one. And the first one is, um, have you enjoyed your time on the podcast? Uh, me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. you've been you've been firm but fair. Uh, yeah. which of, Can I just which say of us it? has been firm and which of us has been fair? Just to, just to <laughs> clarify. Uh, I'm going to sit on the fence again. I couldn't possibly say. Yeah, no, no. no it, is, it, just... is, it, is, it is really, really interesting. Um, and, um, yeah, it's it's like i say i think uh i think everyone needs a seat at the table and i just think you know commu open communication across the board because this is going to involve so many different groups of people to sort out yeah agreed yeah absolutely so with that can you give us a shameless plug if you were to want pest managers and the listeners of this podcast to take home one thing or to do one thing or to potentially buy one thing what would that plug be um what would you get them to go out and do this weekend who who me yes what? you 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 what would i get them to go and do this weekend as in yes yeah. a shameless plug what would you what would the bbka like all of our listeners to do um if, if you could wave a magic wand and you encourage them to do one thing what what would you like them to do to help assist the cause that's a really good question um i i think I, I still think social media is king. If everybody had an image of the Asian Hornet, oh, God, I've been mincing my words now, the Asian Hornet Watch app, I've said it so many times, the Asian Hornet Watch app, they had that QR code and they tweeted it out or put it on their Facebook page or whatever, um, it could get a lot of traction. I think it's so, I mean, QR code all the way. Uh, send us the QR code. We'll put it on the Beauties and Beasties podcast page. We'll set it to open share. You guys, you're listening to this, those on Spotify, those on my LinkedIn, on YouTube, on all of the different channels here, head over to the Beauties and Beasties podcast page. There will be a QR code that you can share to help raise awareness. And as I keep saying all the way through this, turn turn this into a money, you know, turn this into a, an opportunity for, you know, a opportunity from adversary here. Use this as a marketing tool as well as a uh, opportunity to, to spread awareness. So double, double plug. That's probably not the right expression. I should never say that again. That was a horrible thing to say. I can only apologise. Over <laughs> to you, Sean. So, the, the, before the last question, some of the, the spon well, the sponsorship, I think that's coming in from the UKBR. There was talk that what we were going to do was buy a load of traps and then, I don't know, raffle them off or whatever it is. Not raffle them off or donate them or whatever it is. You know, that's that's the way that we were going to go. So if there is any trap manufacturers out there, and if you're one of the couple that I've contacted that hasn't even bothered to reply in, please reply. We weren't after freebies. Um, we want to do something positive off the back of this. So please, 
please get in touch and then maybe we could do something with the bbk and getting them down to the people who need them or i know they've produced a couple of sites haven't they where they've said that they are next year the worries of 2024 you're certainly one of them um, and a couple of others we could do something with that um please feel free to get in touch last question mm -hmm. who would you like to see on the podcast oh my words you saved you've saved the hardest questions till last come on who would you like to see i'm writing them down number one <laughs> i honestly don't know I'll, shall, I shall tell you the the criteria that we've found works best yeah it has to be a, a, a sort of character of a person they have to have something about them um they mm -hmm. have to be incredibly knowledgeable on what they're doing and they have mm -hmm. to be willing to sort of fight their corner so if you could think of someone maybe someone from the mbu you might have to met. give me some time to think about that because everything in no. everybody you've been dealing with is oh, to another do one for the mbu you've done all that yeah, no, but it would be, if you can think of someone interesting, who would you, oh, I don't know, maybe as you're trying to do an outreach for something else, or I don't know, who would you want to see on? Well, I suppose really, you know, given in mind sort of what the, what everybody's talking about at the moment and the concerns that you have about the way forward and where this is coming from, from a sort of government organisation position, then I'd probably say somebody quite high up, um, you know, in terms of... Uh, I don't know, some sort of minister or MP that's responsible for the environment, but that's aiming quite high. But you know, you can't hurt but can't hurt to try, can it? You can absolutely give it a go. We can do we can do a bit of lobbying, can't we, Sean? Um we scrub you know up what relatively is, well. Alex? What? <laughs> I'm, gonna, what? I'm gonna send a letter and I'm gonna put it on the page and we'll let you know if they reply. <laughs> don't hold your breath. <laughs> Minister but you know, I, I think you know that that's that that's what everybody. I think they're the people everybody wants to hear from in terms of what is the plan. But also, you know, sitting on the fence a little bit again, what the challenges are in terms of tackling this thing. You know, if it's mm. a case of having to find a huge amount of money from somewhere when we're already how much ever we are in debt as a country to to tackle something that you know, um, you know, I, I I don't know. You know, I'm sure there's demands um, everywhere. On, so on I'll rephrase things. the question: Who's the most interesting character that you've met in your two months in the post? Oh, um, yeah, but you see, uh, oh, okay. Um, that we haven't already had on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> most I can think interesting of character. Go on, give us a couple and shout them out. Okay. You don't have to just um, name one. Well, but well, they're people that I've spoken to a lot who I find fascinating and I'm really yeah. inspired by. So yeah. one is um, Chloe Underwood on the Isle of Wight from the Isle of Wight BKA. Um, they have done akin to Jersey, the most amazing things in terms of rallying their community. Um, and, Excellent. you know, she's 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 lovely and um, young and proactive and really energetic about this kind of thing. So I've learned a huge amount from her. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I can think of quite a lot of people. Um, well, perfect. give us one more then. Chloe Underwood and who else? Um, well, this is somebody else who who helps. Uh, so this is one of our um, members. Um, so Alan Baxter's fascinating as well. He's recently written a book um, about the Asian Hornet. He knows an awful lot. Very smart guy. And has also been incredibly helpful with his knowledge. Um, but I'm just naming the people here that I've spoken to the most and who have helped me the most in this job. So. Yeah, go on. That's fine. Yeah, go on. One more. One more. Shout them out. Um, gosh, if any anybody throughout this whole, but well, you see, I'd say John, but you had him on last week, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So um, I can think of other people who I think are absolute characters, but I would want to drop a minute by saying it here. There's one person in particular that I know of. Go on, just say it then. Just say it. Go on. She's a lady called Michelle, and she's an absolute stalwart, and she's working around the clock uh, down in Michelle Kent. Michelle who? I'm not going to say her surname because she might not appreciate it, but I'll, I'll, I might I might say it later. Um, oh, I was about to say, I've, I've added the rest of them to LinkedIn already, so <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But yeah. it, she's just somebody who I speak to on a, you know, quite regularly, and um, she's very no-nonsense. So with a recent event, she just strode up to one of the Gardener's Wealth presenters and said, have you heard about the Asian Hornet? And he went, no. And she went, you really should have shoved a card in his face. Lo and behold, the next day he was he sent her an email. And, um, you know, so that that's the kind of people we need on board. Um, yeah. And she is really working around the clock 
on this uh, in her own time and it's just a proper kind of you know really ah gets us up just out before we finish but your yeah. chance to win a hundred pound of amazon vouchers or cash is to be determined um <laughs> Pick the number of nests that you think are going to be found before <laughs> the 1st of November this year. That's a really difficult one. Come on, just um, shout the number out. What do you think? We're on 72. What was 72 last year? 72 last year. Uh, I'm just going to pluck a number out of, off the top yeah. of my head. You see, this puts me in a really difficult position because I would hope that all the efforts that I'm putting in and all the efforts that all the people I'm working alongside are putting in, that this wouldn't happen. So I'm kind of, wow. you know, doing down my own sort of efforts and the efforts of all the people I'm working with. If I go, oh, yeah, there's going to be hundreds. Um, I would hope that we don't see many. It depends whether you believe that this will go in by the way of exponential growth, doesn't it, really? This is, this is the worry, you. How many do you think we'll have? How many do you think? Uh, yeah, I, well, Alex cheated last week. Clearly cheated. Alex cheated. He did not cheat. I, I, I said, applied logic. You, you, no, no, you cheated. <laughs> I said 275, and I was the first guest, so Alex said 276. Yeah, that's cheating. That's it's cheating. Absolutely not. <laughs> I, on, personally, I'm going to write your number down now because you're going on the list. How many do you think? Um... I honestly, I honestly don't know. Um, He's just, just say 274, just to I'm upset gonna say, I'm going to I'll pluck a number out of nowhere and I'll say 100. 100, perfect. There you go. I'm gonna, can I just, um, can I I just, can I just say, the chance of you winning was so slim, you should just say, I think we'll be down to 32 because everything I do well, is going to be brilliant. You I'd, like have done think, that. I'd like to think that we are, we're making yeah. gains. Yes, That's absolutely. I'd like to think we're making gains. Um, but it's like, how long is a piece of string? You know, the, 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 there's yeah, so many yeah, factors yeah. that could influence it, really, yeah. aren't there? Yeah, well. Um, that, you know, we... but there you go. Yeah. Are we done, folks? Any more for any more? Any questions? I think, well, I think there's, there's a... Yes. Um... Another great show. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, wanted to ask this question, but I thought it'd be a bit mean. Oh, no, there we go. No, <laughs> Kirsten, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on. It's been Thank so you. much fun. Um, and and an hour now, an hour and 46 minutes has absolutely flown by. And I'm sure everyone who is listening to this on Monday, as we get the majority of the folks listening to this on Spotify and their cars on Monday, are going to be parked up. And this is going to be my, my bet. And you know, they're all going to be parked up waiting to get into their first job, sat there. They're going to be 15 minutes, half an hour late. Because they want to listen to the end of this. That's going to be my. Oh. That's going to be my prediction. Absolutely. Thank so, you. Okay. And yes, well, and, and thank you everyone. Monday, get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Spend another five minutes, guys. It's all good. <laughs> um, heard it here first. Um, but once again, uh, to everyone listening, either online um, or on repeat it's absolutely thank you ever so much for listening it is you guys that make this uh show what it is and keep sean and i coming back every friday um that's what it is thank you ever so much see you right. all there folks i'll roll the credits catch you later thank you for listening to the beauties and beasties podcast 